Hello Engineering Central, this is Mr. B again, and today we're going to talk about lifting mechanisms. So up to this point, we have talked about things like mechanical advantage, <clears throat> trying to make use of as many mechanisms as you can in order to either increase speed or increase torque. We've also talked about your idlers, your idler gears, and compound gear systems. We've talked about drivetrains, how to make a good turning drivetrain. But now the last thing, and for most competition robotics, is we're going to have to try and lift something. So we've got a drivetrain that we can maneuver and that we can control really, really well, but now let's make it do something. So that's where lifting mechanisms come into play. So the learning goals for this lesson are to conceptualize three main degrees of freedom, the three that are gonna be most relevant to us. We're gonna talk about how to build rotating joints. We're gonna talk about how to build linear elevators. We're going to talk about manipulating objects with four bar linkages, a really, really common um, way of, of building a lifting mechanism. And we're going to talk really, really briefly, or at least introduce you to the concept of passive assistance. So first up, degrees of freedom. You've probably heard this term if you've taken physics or any senior level science, but a degree of freedom refers simply to something's ability to move in a single independent direction of motion. So think about your hand. Your hand is attached to your wrist. If you were to wave at somebody, kind of like Forrest Gump used to wave, if you've seen that movie, he waves his hand side to side. And that is an example of a single degree of freedom. Now, if you use that same hand and try to wave at somebody to, to, to come closer, for example, then you're using a second degree of freedom because your hand is now kind of waving back and forth, forward and backwards. So those are two different degrees of freedom. So to be able to move in multiple directions means to have multiple degrees of freedom. So your wrist has multiple degrees of freedom. It can move up and down. It can move side to side, left to right. It can actually even move forward and back. If you look at the little example that we've got here, this is a wrist joint. Wrist joint on the, this is the, the wrist joint right here, or the wrist itself, it's attached to the arm. And here's the joint and it rotates in a circle so that so this motion is a degree of freedom. Now there are three most relevant degrees. So the first one is this one that we're looking at right here on this screen. So this degree of freedom, it can move this way, it can also move this way. That's a single degree of freedom. And that's when the robot's arm is rotating about an axis parallel to the arm. So here's the arm. And so the axis that it's rotating around is parallel to that arm. So for example, this claw, this claw bot is holding onto a pencil. That pencil can be running parallel to the floor, but it can also turn and twist it so that the pencil becomes up and down and aims, aims towards the ceiling. That is a single degree of freedom. The second really common degree of freedom is linear. So in this case, we're talking about an elevator. So an elevator is a linear actuation system that can lift up and down. So here it is in its down state. Here it is in, an, in its up state. So it's raising this platform upon which you can lift something. So that's an elevator. It's a type of joint or component that can slide up and down. And so that's a single degree of freedom. It's a linear degree of freedom. A desk drawer is another example of a, a linear degree of freedom that is moving out or sorry, um, in and out. So that's the second degree of freedom that we're going to talk about that you're probably going to encounter. And then the third one is a rotation. So in this case, we've got a rotation around an axis that's perpendicular to the arm. So here's the arm running straight up, and the axis upon which it's rotating is this pin right here, right here, around which this gear and, very, and this, this arm that's attached to the gear by these two screws is rotating. So that's a third degree of freedom. It's a rotation about an axis perpendicular to an arm. The most common type of joint that you'll probably be building in class is this type of rotating joint. You can see a picture of it on this screen. It's most frequently used lifting mechanism in competition robotics, or at least at this level of competition robotics, and probably at any level. And this picture is a two-jointed arm. So if we've got a shoulder here, 
and we've got a wrist here. Typically speaking, when we talk, when we label joints on a robot, we label them the same way as we, ro uh, we label them on our own bodies. So we've got a sh we, very common joints would be shoulder, elbow, and wrist. Now in this case, it's just a double jointed arm, a two jointed arm. So we've got a shoulder and a wrist. So if we take a closer look at this system, at these joints, this arm system here, you'll notice that the shoulder joint, this one right here, has a significantly higher gear, re gear reduction than the wrist joint. So we've got a shoulder and a wrist. The shoulder has a compound gear set up on it, whereas the wrist joint only has a typical or regular um, single gear ratio set up on it. So we've got a significantly higher reduction on one than the other. Why do you think that is? If you can't figure it out, just look at the load. Look at what each joint has to raise. So the motor loading is significantly different. So this joint down here, the shoulder joint, has significantly more of a load on it than the wrist joint. So the shoulder joint needs to be able to lift the weight of the entire arm. So this guy right here, it's got to be able to raise the weight of the wrist. This guy right here, it's got to be able to raise the weight of the claw. This guy right here, it's got to be able to raise whatever is being picked up by the claw right here. And it also is on a long lever. And so as we know, the longer the lever, the more torque is required. So there's a lot of load on that joint. On the wrist joint, however, you only have to really raise the weight of the claw and whatever's picked up in it. It's not a very long lever, so you don't have tons of torque that's required for that one. So because of the load, different varying degrees of load on each joint, um, whoever has built this system has compensated for that by creating a much higher gear reduction where necessary. So if we take a look at this one, this is a little bit of a different robot. We have a double reduction rotation joint. This is a really good idea when you're trying to raise something fairly heavy. It has two stages of a 12 to 60 gear ratio. So here's the driving gear. A motor will be attached to that. Here's the first driven gear. So that's a 12 to 60 ratio. We've got a second in a compound system here, a second um, 12 tooth gear here, followed by another driven gear of 60 teeth. So we've got a two stage 12 to 60 gear reduction. So the second stage here, it's actually attached directly to the robot arm. So here's the robot arm and it is attached through these screws directly to that gear. It also actually has the same, two of the same gear reductions running in parallel, one on each side. So we've got these four gears set up the same on the other side of the arm. So that means that the load is divided evenly over these two sets of gears. So not only have we geared this up for good torque, but we've also geared this up. We've doubled the gear. We've got a like a double um, joint here just so that it's less likely to have a failure if it picks up something that is overly heavy. So it's a really, really good idea to protect against shock loads. A shock load is an instantaneous spike of loading on a mechanical system. So if there is some force applied at the end of a robot arm, it will apply a torque on the joint equal to the magnitude of the force times the distance from the joint. So it means that if an arm that is two times longer than another arm that's lifting the same object, that arm that's two times longer will require two times as much torque. So if you've got a long lever and you're acquiring all, all sorts of extra torque, it's a great, that's, those are systems, those are places where you may want to build, use mechanical advantage in order to get more torque out of it, but also maybe even use a double joint to protect against those shocks. And so the shocks we talk about as a factor of safety as well. So you should ensure that your joints can handle unanticipated loads. And there's a bit of a formula, depends on, on what you're building, I suppose, that will determine the formula. But you should include the ability to lift more than you initially think. So if you know that the robot needs to be able to lift with a force of 10 newtons, for example, you should probably design your robot to handle 12 newtons. This would be a factor of safety of 1.2. 10 times 1.2 equals 12. So that's where you get your factor of safety. So we're about to get into joint speed.
So we've just spoken about how to protect your joints, your various joints, from shock loads. Now let's talk about speed. Because we know that torque and speed are inversely proportional. So you do want the joint to move quickly, but typically speaking, you don't want the speed to be the primary objective. Because you can build a joint that's really, really fast and it's completely useless because you can't control it. So you want to be able to balance that. You want to move as quickly as, as you can, well, as quickly as you can control it. You don't want to move as quickly as, it, as you can because otherwise, chances are, um, it's actually going to be less useful than a slower joint. Another consideration about a rotating joint is the fact that it arcs. So a rotating joint will cause the lift lifting mechanism to swing in an arc about the point of rotation. Now this means, and you can take a look here, this means that when, in this little diagram, when your arm is at this level, whatever it is that you're holding, notice how close you have to be, how, how the robot has to be to the platform or the goal or whatever it is that where you're trying to deliver um, the object that you've lifted up. However, if you raise the arm up to this position, then you've got to be that much farther away, really, in order to drop it. If it's an elevated platform, if you're trying to um, place it onto a platform of this size, but look how close you have to be to the, to the platform if you're trying to drop it onto something this high. So the driver or your autonomous program has to be able to position the robot the correct distance away from the target based on the height of the arm. So that's a limitation really of a rotating joint. Another limitation of the rotating joint is that it's got a changing orientation. So an object that's gripped by a rotating joint changes orientation as the arm lifts. Take a look at this. If you are lifting a cup full of water and you're to raise it up like this, that cup is going to spill. Here's all the water spilling out because the cup on this rotating joint changes orientation. So that's another consideration when you're deciding what type of lifting net mechanism to build. A rotating joint is great. There are lots of ways that you can make sure that it is strong and able to lift a good heavy load but what do you have to do with that load? If it cannot change orientation, then a rotating joint's probably not for you. If you want to be really, really consistent in how close your robot has to be to the goal, then a rotating joint might not be for you. So what else can you do? Well, we can actually make a linear elevator. So in this scenario, we're using another um, lifting mechanism. It's less common, but it's got significant advantages. This one has a degree of freedom, freedom of up and down. Typically it's going to be built, well, it doesn't have to be, but often you'll see these built with a rack and pinion type of system. For any of you in the drivetrain unit that we just covered who tried to build an Ackerman style of turning mechanism, you'll be quite familiar with the rack and pinion style. The pinion gear which is the round gear, it spins with whatever force is applied to it. And that torque is then applied to the, applies a linear force at the edge of the teeth, right here, to this linear actuation system, these linear gears. And that drives the mechanism up and down. You can also do a similar elevator system using chains and sprockets. So the torque on the driving sprocket spins the chain and then the chain is attached to whatever linear device it is. So in this case, we've got a linear device that's attached to the chain right here. And that's able to spin. Now notice that it's it'll be upside down on this side. It'll be something like that on this side with the attachment here, and it'll be straight out here. But over here, you'll be able to lift something, so it'll be lifting up in one direction. You can also use a winch system. In this case, the motor would apply torque to the winch that provides a linear force along a rope, which drives the entire mechanism. Now, in our robot competitions, a 1 8 inch braided nylon rope is allowed. And you can also buy a winch and pulley system, which we don't have by default, but you can buy one for $20. I'm going to fly through this one because I don't expect we'll be using this one, but maybe we will. And just for learning purposes, know that this is another type of elevator system. And with elevators, you can actually build multiple stages. 
So by stacking multiple linear elevators together, you can create a mechanism that will reach up much higher than its own height. So here we've got a fairly complex sprocket and chain system where you're able to pull it down to this level, but expand it to this level. So that's something to play with. Play around with these types of systems. See what kind of elevation you can get from a multiple stage elevator. Another option are linkages. So linkages are designed to convert an input motion into a different output motion. Usually consists of a series of rigid bodies or links that are connected together by freely rotating joints. And typically, one link is fixed and cannot move while another link is driven in some input motion. So again, those of you who played with the Ackerman style of, of uh, steering system in your drivetrain projects, you would have built a sort of linkage where one body, the, the part of the, your, um, your rack and pinion system that was attached to the chassis, it is rigid, it does not move. Whereas the other part that was attached to your wheels, it did rotate and it did move. So that's a type of linkage. There's a fundamental part of any kind of machine design. It allows you all sorts of options to create a wide variety of output options. You can alter the path, the velocity, the acceleration of the input, and it's very repeatable. So you can quite, you can quite easily think of a pair of vice grips like this. So we probably all use these. In this scenario, we've got a fixed link so regardless of, the, of, of what position the vice grips are in, this link does not change. See, it does not change position. It's the driven link. That's what changes position. And that's what actually in affects this part, the motion. So that's an example of a linkage. Here are some other examples. Most common for our robotic systems would be a four bar linkage. It's one of the simplest and most common linkage types. And really, it's quite basic. It can be very basic. You've got lengths here that are equal. And they're also parallel to each other. And by varying the length, so when the, in the down system here, these equidistant parallel bars, and these are equidistant and parallel, but look at the orientation they get into, as opposed to straight, as opposed to up. Here's another view of them. There are lots of different four bar options. This is the one that you were just looking at. Straight out, everything's parallel. Up, or even higher up. You're able to reach quite high. Here's a different type of four bar option. You can see how those would move and change based on the orientation and based on the linkages. So I highly recommend that you play, you experiment with four bar linkage configurations. There are lots of them and they can be quite powerful. So when you're trying to build a lifting mechanism, there are a few things that you should consider. First off, how high does whatever object need to be? What's the elevation that you require? What's the orientation of the object need to be? Does it have to be flat? Does it have to be placed on a high platform in exactly the same orientation as it was picked up off the floor? What starting configuration or size limitations are you in? So our competitions, they have to be able to start, the robot has to start, including the entire lifting mechanism in an 18 inch cube. So that means that it's gotta be able to elevate or change in order to lift higher than 18 inches. And also, what complexity do you want? Typically, you want to build the simplest mechanism possible to achieve your design goals. Simple mechanisms, they, they just, they fail less. They have fewer moving parts, they tend to be more robust, and they're less likely to fail. Now, I don't want to discourage you from experimenting and being creative and coming up with amazing things, but just bear in mind that for competition robotics, you want something that's going to work, that's going to be consistent, that's going to be repeatable, that's going to be reliable. Um, the more complex it is, just the more options, the more points of failure there are. And then obviously, this seems fairly obvious, but you should also be aware of the number of motors that are required or even available. That's actually gonna be more the, the, uh, the limitation usually is how many are available. 
And then the last point that I want to think about, that I want you to think about, is a concept called passive, res passive assistance. And that's essentially adding something to the lifting mechanism to assist the actuator in lifting the load. So think springs or counterbalances or elastic bands. In our competitions, we are allowed elastic bands. So using a passive assistance system can greatly reduce the load on motors and allow for faster mechanisms. So think about an elastic band. If I've got an arm that needs to lower and lift up a really, really heavy object, if I have the elastic band such that I have to stretch that elastic band to lower the arm to pick up the object, well now, now comes the, the heavy load that I'm placing on the on my my joints. I have to lift whatever object it is. If I've got a bunch of elastic bands that are stretched out now, well now they're going to assist because they, they want to con constrict. They want to get back to their normal small shape. So they're pulling up at the same time as the motors, the joints are pulling up, which means that they can really, really assist you lifting up heavy mechanisms. You can use these things to your advantage. So passive assistance is a concept to enable you to balance or to reduce the weight, the load that's going to be applied to your joints. So there are some things to think about when it comes to lifting mechanisms. What type of joint do you want? How many degrees of freedom do you want? Um, how complex do you want it to be? And how can you balance the load such that your system does not break down? Good luck with building your lifting mechanisms.